Anthony Davies is the Milton Friedman Distinguished Fellow at the Foundation for Economic Education, an Associate Professor of Economics at Duquesne University. Dr. Uh, sorry, Dr. Davies co-hosts Words and Numbers, a weekly podcast on economics and policy. He has written books on statistics, economics, and public policy, including one that was published by ISI entitled Cooperation and Coercion, a copy of which has been placed on a table for you and has co-authored hundreds of op-eds uh, for, among others, The Wall Street Journal, Los Angeles Times, New York Daily News, The Huffington Post, and The Washington Post. His YouTube videos on economics, government, and policy have garnered millions of views. He was associate uh, producer at the Moving Pictures Institute, chief financial officer at Parabon Computation, and founded several technology companies. Davies earned, earned his BS in um, economics from St. Vincent College and PhD in economics from the Saint, State University of New York at Albany. He'll be delivering a talk for us today entitled, after his book, Cooperation and Coercion. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Davies. Thank you. So this talk is inspired by my book, Cooperation and Coercion, but there's no uh, spoilers here. So you can watch the talk and read the book and you get two different experiences. Um, what, what gives rise to this whole topic is the observation, if you look throughout history, you'll notice every time human beings come together to do anything, we organize ourselves in one of two ways either via principles of coercion, where some of us tell the rest of us what to do, or via principles of cooperation, where we come together voluntarily and do things, and if they work out, that's great, we keep doing them, and if they don't work out, we walk away and we do something else. But everything human beings do fall under one of these two categories of organization, cooperation or coercion. And I'm going to talk a lot about the benefits of cooperation and the lack of benefits to coercion, but stick with me because later on I'll talk about some drawbacks to cooperation. The reason I'm going to hit coercion so hard is because that's the thing we go to when we see a problem. Our knee-jerk reaction is to turn to Washington and say, solve this problem. So I want to, I want to caution you stringently against going to coercion as, as the default. So think about, for a moment, a scenario. Here we have cooperation. This guy, we'll call him naked guy, he's got a problem. His problem is he's naked. And he thinks to himself, I'd like a suit, and I have money to pay for a suit. And along comes this guy. We'll call him the guy on the left. And the guy on the left says, look, I see that you need something. You need a suit. And how about this? I have a dress. And naked guy says, no, dress makes me sad. I want a suit. <laughs> and so when we organize ourselves according to principles of cooperation, what happens? The guy on the left has incentive to go off and figure out how he can make naked guy happy. And so he comes back with a suit. And naked guy says, yeah, that's what I'm looking for. That makes me happy. Here, take my money. Give me the suit and they both walk away happy. They're both better off than they were before. And how do I know they're better off than they were before? Precisely because the relationship was voluntary. If one or the other of them were not better off than they were before, they wouldn't engage in this transaction. Or if they did engage in this transaction, they'd say, oh my god, I'm not doing that again. And that's the last time they'd engage in the transaction. So the fact that it's voluntary indicates that, at least in the long run, both of these people are benefiting. Now, think about the same scenario using the organizing principle of coercion. So we've got naked guy, and naked guy says to himself, I wish I had a suit, and I have money to pay for a suit. And if we organize ourselves according to coercion, along comes the government, and the government says, you're naked. Here, put this on, and give me your money. And of course, naked guy is sad. And this is one of several problems I'm going to highlight with coercion as an organizing principle, and that's the knowledge problem. That's that the people in government, they don't need to be malicious. They don't need to be um, stupid. They can be well-meaning, intelligent people, and yet they will still tend, not always, but they'll tend 
to get decisions wrong. And they get decisions wrong because of this knowledge problem. The, the coercer does not know better than the naked guy what the naked guy needs, what the naked guy wants. Now, in this scenario, you could say it's quite obvious what the guy wants. He wants a suit. Yeah, but this is one guy. Imagine you had 320 million of these people. And it wasn't just suit or not suit, suit or dress. It was suits of multiple colors and different things and not a suit at all, but I'd like a new DVD player or whatever it is, right? And so you can see the problem, the knowledge problem, the people in who are doing the coercing, even if they are well-intentioned, even if they're intelligent, they simply don't have enough information to be able to make decisions that are, on average, better than what the individuals can make themselves. Another problem arises, which is you've got naked guy and he has a, looks for a suit and he's got some money to pay for a suit and along comes guy on the left. The guy on the left says, I've got a dress. And naked guy says, no, dress makes me sad. Now, under principles of cooperation, this guy would go off and try and figure out how he can make naked guy happy. Under principles of coercion, there's all of a sudden a new way that guy on the left can make a buck. And that's to figure out how to make government happy. And so naked guy summons government, says, I got something, and government shows up. And guy on the left says, make that guy buy my dress, and I'll give you a little something in exchange for it. Now, the little something in exchange, of course, bribing politicians is illegal, but we bribe them in all sorts of ways that are legal. Think about revolving doors, and I'm an oil company executive, and you're a regulator who regulates the oil company. And we have an understanding, and it is probably not explicit, that you've regulated me, and when you're done doing your job, I have a board position for you. And that's a benefit to you. And you know that while you're still a regulator, and so you're going to go a little bit easy on me, right? And so there's different ways that I can pay you off without explicitly paying you off. And that's what happens here. And of course what happens, well, naked guy is sad, but guy on the left, he's quite happy. And this is the second problem that we have with a coercive form of organization, regulatory capture. That when you ask the government to regulate, to coerce, Often, the people who are being regulated have the opportunity and the incentive to co-opt the regulators to their benefit. Another problem exists here is what we'll call political profit. That is, the politicians themselves are profiting from this regulatory capture. And so, coercion alone fails as an organizing principle because of the knowledge problem, because of regulatory capture, and because of political profit. Now I want to talk a little bit about the knowledge problem. Imagine if we drove by coercion, how bad that would look. So how would this work? Picture that what we do is every driver has to paint over his windows with black paint so you can't see outside. And on the cars, we have mounted cameras front and back and to the side. And all these camera feeds go into some central location where some very smart people analyze what's going on and radio instructions to the drivers. They say, driver 12, I need you to speed up five miles an hour. Driver 14, I need you to turn left. Driver 8, I need you to turn right, whatever it is, right? You can imagine the problems that arise here. And that's even excluding all sorts of other information that the central planners might need. For example, where does each driver want to go? What stops might they want, want to make along the way? Who's in a hurry? Who's not? What are the road conditions? What are the cars around you doing? All sorts of information that the coercers, the central planners, don't have. And of course, this is a stupid way to do driving. If you think about a simple case, suppose you've got 10,000 cars with just 10 options of speed up, slow down, turn left, turn right, stuff like this. That's 100,000 decisions. And the circumstances are constantly changing. By the time the central planners collect all the information that they can and come to some decision as to what's supposed to happen and they radio car number eight and they say, car number eight, I need you to turn left. By the time all of that happens, there's a truck and car number eight runs into it. 
And if you think that's an outlandish example, I give you the current state of our financial markets and the Federal Reserve. By the time the very smart people at the Federal Reserve figure out what interest rates should be, the economy has moved on. And now we're left in a situation where the Federal Reserve is stepping on the gas when it should be stepping on the brake, or vice versa. Another problem arises with uh, the knowledge problem. We call this unintended consequences. An unintended consequence is what happens when I make a decision for you and you react to the fact that you cannot make the decision for yourself. So I put you in a situation where you cannot choose, I'm going to choose for you, and the mere fact of that causes you to alter your behavior and causes things to occur that I never intended. Unintended consequence. I'll give you a couple examples. Um, CEO pay, every few decades in this country, people lose their minds about how much CEOs earn. And we go to Congress and we say, you need to do something about this. And this was um, back in the mid-1980s. It became a very big problem and people went to Congress and said, look, these CEOs are making whatever it is, 127 times as much as what the average worker makes. You need to do something. So what Congress did is applied a little coercion. And it said, all right, we're going to require that corporations publicly report CEO pay. The intent was to shame them, to shame the boards of directors, because this is now public information. This guy's making all this money. And as boards of directors and CEOs try to find ways to get compensation around taxes, we're going to tax these new forms of CEO compensation. So all of this aimed at controlling, restricting how much CEOs are paid. Well, all of this had an effect that within about 10 years, CEO pay in this country rose. And it rose for a number of reasons, but one of the major reasons was a direct result of this. A direct result of attempts to restrict CEO pay actually encouraged CEOs to be paid more. And if you think it through, you'll see why. Imagine how people react to this. So all of a sudden, CEO pay packages become public information in a very clear way. So you can you put a dollar value to everything the CEO is receiving. We could say this CEO's pay package is worth this amount. Well, one of the things that happened was a lot of CEOs in this country discovered that they were underpaid. <laughs> and so started demanding more money. Also, when Congress started taxing these newfangled sorts of CEO pay packages. One example is the golden parachute. So in the mid-1980s, about 8% of CEOs received as part of their pay package a golden parachute. It, you probably know what a golden parachute is. It says, if, you, if we, the board directors, fire you, and there's some footnotes about, you know, I can fire you for certain things, but generally speaking, if you're being fired for something that is not criminal, then here's a chunk of money, $5 million, you get it. You automatically get this money if you're fired. This is a golden parachute. In the mid-1980s, only about 8% of CEOs received these golden parachutes. Congress, as part of this push to restrict CEO pay, looked at these golden parachutes and classified them as a taxable event and attached a tax to it. The intent being to restrict CEO pay. Well, the unintended consequence was that by identifying the golden parachute as a thing and saying, here's how we're going to tax it, Congress basically put an imprimatur on it and said, yeah, this is OK. This is a thing. This is legal. And gave it a tremendous amount of publicity. And so now you've got a bunch of CEOs over there saying, hey, what is that? I want one of those. <laughs> and within a decade, the number of CEOs in the United States who received golden parachutes went from 8% to over 50%, in large part as a result of Congress attempting to tax and restrict this thing. Another example, Philadelphia, the big city here in Pennsylvania, um, put a, track, uh, a tax on sugary drinks. This was about 18 months, maybe two years ago. The intent was to reduce health problems amongst teenagers by preventing overconsumption of these drinks that they shouldn't be having. 
So the coercers, the central planners, get together and say, it's wrong for you to drink this stuff. And so what we're going to do is we're going to make these sugary drinks more expensive. And Philadelphia imposed a 30% tax, 3-0, 30% tax on sugary drinks like you see here. And what happened? Well, what happened is there ensued a 30% drop in sugary drink sales in Philadelphia, to which the central planners said, see, this is exactly what we're talking about. This is how coercion works. They didn't say coercion. This is how central planning, this is how regulation works. We want people to drink less sugary drinks, and lo and behold, we impose this tax, and that's what happened. To which economists replied, hang on a second. I thought you said you wanted people to drink less sugary drinks. To which I said, well, yeah, of course, see? And the economist said, no, no, you're telling me sales of sugary drinks declined. To which the regulators say, well, of course, the sales declined, which means people are consuming less. The economists went and actually did consumer surveys and asked, how much sugary drinks are you drinking now compared to before? And what they found is that there was no change in sugary drink consumption. Now that's weird. How can it be that sugary drink sales dropped by 30% and yet sugary drink consumption in Philadelphia did not change? And the answer is an unintended consequence. And the unintended consequence was that in the face of this 30% tax on sugary drinks, people drove outside of Philadelphia to buy their sugary drinks. And as long as you're going to go to the effort to drive outside of Philadelphia to buy your sugary drinks, and you're there, you might as well buy the rest of your groceries. And consequently, food sales in Philadelphia plummeted. And there were a number of grocery stores that closed because of this. It's an unintended consequence of coercion. I take away your ability to make decisions for yourself, or I modify it in some way, and you react in ways I didn't anticipate. This is a problem of, un of, um, of coercion. All right, so that's the knowledge problem of unintended consequences. Let's talk about regulatory capture. What you're seeing there, adjusted for inflation, are the costs of the six most expensive wars the US has fought. Two of those are wars in the sense that we traditionally think of wars, World War II and the Vietnam War. The rest, the war on poverty, the war on terror, our war on COVID, the war on drugs, are all what my co-author and I call the wars on nouns. We declare wars on ideas. What happens with regulatory capture is that regulatory agencies end up becoming influenced by the very people they're intended to regulate. And what's happened here is if you take the most expensive one, the war on poverty. My slides are off this thing. Oh, you know why? Because I have wide screen over here and you don't see the wide screen there. Okay. The war on poverty has become dominated by interests that benefit from poverty programs. And I don't mean it's come to be dominated by the poor. I mean it's come to be dominated by the people who help to service the poor. What you're looking at there, those are all of the federal programs that exist. And I don't mean they, they're the federal programs that have existed over time. They are all the federal programs that exist right now to fight poverty in this country. There are over 100 of these. All the various ways that we wage war on poverty, this is it. And what's happened in our war on poverty? This is the US poverty rate and you can see back when we started the war in 1967, it stayed at about 13%. Now, Gary Quinlivan, who spoke earlier, quoted some numbers from uh, Thomas Sowell, that this poverty rate is uh, overestimating poverty, and economists have estimated that it could be overestimating by as much as 50%. So even if you cut these numbers in half, you still get about the same response, which is whether the number's at roughly 13% or roughly 7.5%, six and a half percent, it stays constant after our declaration of the war on poverty. Now, when I point this out to people, 
that we've spent $23 trillion on the war on poverty, and what we got for it in exchange was a basically constant 13%, or 6.5% if you like, poverty rate. The response is, yeah, but imagine how bad poverty would have been if we hadn't spent this. That's a reasonable counter-argument. But let's think it through for a moment. We have spent, since the start of the war on poverty in 1967, adjusted for inflation, $23 trillion. What else could we have done with $23 trillion over that same period? Well, it turns out that over that same period, we could have cut a check to every poor person in the United States for $10,000 a year. And that would have cut the poverty rate to zero. We could have spent the past half century being the first country on the planet ever to have completely eradicated poverty. For the same amount of money that we spend on the 100 plus programs that have kept our poverty rate at 13% or 6.5%, however you want to measure it, constantly since 1967. Why is it that we didn't do the second thing? We didn't do the second thing because of regulatory capture. Because it wouldn't take 101 odd programs to cut a check for $10,000 to every poor person in the country. It would take precisely no extra programs. The IRS already does all of this. It collects information on your incomes every year. It cut checks, cuts checks to people every year. The IRS could handle this with exactly the infrastructure it has right now. And we don't do this. Why don't we do this? Because of regulatory capture. Because the people, both in the public and the private sectors, who benefit from those 101 programs, they don't want us to do this. Because they'd all be out of jobs. On top of that, the politicians who campaign on topics like the poor, elect me and I'll help the poor, I'll eliminate poverty, and you cheer for me and you elect me. And do I want to eliminate poverty? No, I don't. Because so long as poverty persists, I can use it again in the next election cycle. And when I come up for re-election, I say to you, look, I understand, I promised that I would eradicate poverty, and I'm trying my hardest. The problem is those people across the aisle, they're evil. Or I wanted to spend X dollars and they gave me X minus K. Elect me once more and I can do it right this time. And then in two or four years, I'll say all the same words over again, figuring that you've forgotten that I said them before. So knowledge problem, regulatory capture, and then finally this third problem with coercion is political profit. I want you to think for a moment, consider all sources of non-governmental income that people might earn. So wages and salaries, business income, capital gains, rental income, deferred income, interest income, however you can imagine people earning income from some, any source other than the government. Imagine that. And then, do all the accounting and legal gymnastics you want to reduce your tax liability. So do deductions and exemptions and write-offs and all of that nonsense. And when you're done, Tell me, how much federal taxes did you pay? And when I say federal taxes, I mean any form of federal tax. Personal income tax, business income tax, capital gains, payroll, excise, whatever it is that the federal government collects. Add up all of it. So here's what I want you to think about in your mind. What fraction of people's incomes do they actually pay? I'm not asking what tax bracket are you in. I'm asking what fraction of your income do you actually pay to the IRS? So we're going to take all of this income that you earn from all sources and divide it, sorry, the other way around, take all the taxes that you paid and divide it by all of the income that you earn. And that we'll call the average effective federal tax rate. That, when all the dust settles, is what you're actually paying. Now, I'm going to show you figures for, this is the latest IRS figures, which are from 2017. Um, poorest 20% of households, middle 20% of households, and the top 1%. What you're looking at is their, what the IRS classifies as their market incomes. That is the income they earn from non-governmental sources. 
So the poorest household is earning roughly $16,000, all the way up to the top, the average top one percenter is earning almost two million. Now, what's fair? We like to talk in this country about people paying their fair share. Whenever someone says to me those words that so and so should be paying their fair share, my next question is, tell me what's fair. Because how do I know that we've re that they are or are not paying their fair share if you can't tell me what fair is? Now I've asked this question to my students, both undergraduate and graduate, and from time to time I talk to high school students, I ask them as well. Tell me what's fair. And there's no right or wrong answer here. It's simply your opinion. What, in your opinion, is fair? And by fair, I mean, you know, talk about average effective tax rate, tax rate in which I described it, right? What do these people actually pay? And when I ask this question, I get all kinds of numbers, but oddly a pattern. Most people, and this goes from high school up through graduate students, they come in numbers roughly around there. So for the poor, some people will go as low as zero, some people will go as high as 10 or 15 percent, but most people answer 5 percent for the poorest 20 percent. That's how much of their income they should be paying in federal taxes. That's fair. And I ask about the middle income households, and people come in around 15 percent. Some will go as low as 10, some will go as high as 20, but typically it's 15 percent is what people say. And the top 1 percent, Surprisingly, there's the most agreement here. Once in a while, I'll get a crazy person who says 90% or another crazy person who says zero. But I'd say 80% of people I ask come in at around 30%, plus or minus a little bit. So for whatever reason, Americans, at least in the age bracket of high school to graduate student, seem at a gut level to think this is about right. This is fair. All right, let's look at how much federal taxes these groups actually pay. The poorest 20% in 2017 paid $300 per household. On average, some more, some less. This is average. The average household in the middle income bracket, the middle 20%, paid roughly $10,000. And the average household in the top 1% paid six, over $600,000. Now do the math. And there's the effective federal tax rate you get. 2%, 17%, 32%. They're remarkably close to what people say is fair. And if you look at the numbers, the average household in the top 1% is earning 120 times what the poorest 20% is. And this is the thing that people will point to and say, look, this is clearly unfair. And yet, if you look at their taxes, the average household in the top 1%, while he's earning 120 times what the poor household's earning, he's paying more than 2,000 times the taxes. And remember, this is after all of the deductions and exemptions and write-offs and all of that stuff. This is what they're actually paying. Now, are there some who pay less and some who pay more? Sure. This is the average that you're seeing for the top 1%, the poorest 20%. So our federal tax rate, as it is, ends up hitting what people already are saying to me, by and large, they consider fair. Yeah, except the story's not done. Because what I have shown you completely ignores what we call federal transfers. And a federal transfer is the opposite of a tax. Instead of taking money out of your pocket, I'm going to put money into it. Some federal transfers come in the form of Social Security benefits. A lot of them come in the form of the Earned Income Tax Credit. And there are various other things, income assistance, things, a lot of the things we do to help the poor. And that's fine. There are things we do to help the poor. But it's the government putting money in your pocket instead of taking it out. And if you want to talk about taxes, we should really talk about the net. Not simply what am I taking from you, but what am I taking from you net of what I'm giving you. And if we do that, we find, and again, more for some households, less for others, but these are the averages. The average poor household receives about $20,000 in transfers, up to $13,000 for the top 1%. You might ask why the top 1% are receiving anything. The bulk of that's coming in the form of Social Security benefits. But if you subtract one from the other, 
and ask, what was your income before the government showed up versus your income after the government showed up? What you find is that the poor households are paying negative 120% tax. The middle income households are paying negative 3% tax. The top 1% are paying 31%. So when I show people these numbers, people who have raised to me this issue of fairness, I say be very careful jumping on that question of fairness. Because if you look at the numbers correctly, you find that indeed our tax code is not fair. But it's not fair in the opposite direction of what you think. This raises another, um, on average, in the United States, and again, on average, on average, only the top 40% are net payers into the federal system. There are exceptions, but on average, this is the case, that if you're in the top 40% of, of income earners, you're paying more than you get back. If you're in the lower 40%, lower 60%, you're getting back from the federal government more than you pay in. And so this puts us in this weird situation where we have made our tax code net of transfers so incredibly progressive that by definition, almost all tax cuts are tax cuts for the rich. Because on average, that's who's paying. All right, what does this have to do with political profit? There's political profit here in fomenting class conflict. Politicians, as Thomas Sowell points out, exist to solve their problems, not ours. And he has a beautiful quote that I will not do justice to. He says, in effect, look, politicians' primary goal is to get elected. Their secondary goal is to get reelected. And somewhere after that comes doing whatever's best for the electorate. Their goals are to get elected. Now, if you're in a situation like I've just described, where our tax code is so incredibly progressive that we've got a bunch, we've got a bunch to people over here who are earning a tremendous amount, I could take from them, I can give to the people over here. I, the politician, notice something, and that is I benefit, I get votes if I can deliver benefits to voters. I can, in effect, in effect buy off the voters. Give you more stuff, you'll vote for me. The downside to that is I've got to raise taxes to pay for the stuff I'm giving you. So the question is, how do I do that? Because you're going to like getting stuff from me, but you're not going to like paying for it. And what politicians have discovered is the solution to this quandary. That is, deliver benefits to a majority. Give the benefits to a majority of the voters. And pay for them by either taxing a minority or taxing people who can't vote. If I can pull that off, I, the politician, solve my problem of getting elected. Because a majority of you end up receiving money from the federal government. A minority of you, who aren't going to like me, but I don't care, you're in the minority, end up paying for it. All I've got to do is pull off this, one or the other or both of these. Either tax the minority of people or tax people who can't vote. And taxing minority is class warfare. And that's exactly what you see going on right now. Politicians will argue the problem is the rich who are selfish and not paying their fair share. Or alternatively, the problem is the poor. They're sucking up our resources and not contributing anything. So long as I, the politician, can keep all of you fighting amongst each other, I can continue this game of siphoning off the minority of you who have money, taking it from you, giving it to the majority. I lose your votes, but I gain theirs, and they outnumber you, so I win. The other way I can pull this off is by taxing people who can't vote. How in God's name do you tax people who can't vote? Any ideas? Yes? Tax businesses. Tax the what? Businesses. No, not taxing the businesses. Now, this is an interesting thing that I'll do, and I'll put that under the, under the heading of class warfare. I'll tell you the problem is the corporations, they're not paying their fair share. And so I get you all mad at the corporations. That's actually great for me, because corporations don't vote. Yeah, except here's the thing. Corporations don't pay taxes. They collect taxes. 
Every dollar of tax a corporation pays comes from one of three sources, either customers in the form of higher prices, or workers in the form of reduced wages, or stockholders, investors in the form of lesser returns. When you ask the government to tax the corporation, you're really asking it to tax one or more of those three groups of people. You've just hidden what you're doing because the dollars are being filtered through the corporation. So that I classify as class warfare. How in God's name do I tax people who can't vote? Yes? Taxing people outside of your district. Yeah, yeah, okay. Sure, they can't vote for me. Yeah, that works. How else? Yes? Tax the young? Yeah, you take out debt. That's it. Runaway debt. Every time I borrow, I, the government, every time I borrow, I am imposing a tax on future generations. Because that money either A, has to be repaid, or B, if it's not repaid, you have to continually pay interest on it. Either way, what I have done when I borrow is to impose a tax on future generations. It's the ultimate of taxation without representation. Who's going to pay for the almost $30 trillion debt we have now? Either pay it off or continue to pay forever the interest on it. A little bit me, a little bit you, mostly our descendants. And they don't get to vote. So this is political profit. So our three problems with why coercion alone fails as an organizing principle. The knowledge problem, which gives rise to unintended consequences. This regulatory capture, where the people I'm regulating actually have an incentive to co-opt the government, to co-opt the regulators, and get them to act in their favor. And so we have something like the welfare state that becomes a $23 trillion boondoggle. And this last thing of political profit, where I, the politician, as a coercer, actually have an incentive to pit you against each other to my benefit. This is why co coercion alone fails as an organizing principle. I claim cooperation alone also fails as an organizing principle because of diversity. Because some of us are smarter than others. Because some of us are more attractive than others. Because some of us are stronger than others. Because some of us are more talented than others. Some of us are born to better circumstances than others. Some of us are simply luckier than others. Because we're different in these important ways, some of us will be in a position to exploit, to take advantage of others among us. We need coercion to prevent that. If you want to prevent the strong from exploiting the weak, you've got to fall back on coercion. And the most staunch advocate of limited government will still tell you, we need a strong judicial system. We need the rule of law. We do need government. It just needs to be sitting in this very restrained box. In that statement, yes, we need restrained government. It means, yeah, we do need some coercion. You don't want. UPMC over here to start dumping pollutants into the Ohio River because, well, it can. No, I want to prevent that. And coercion is what's going to be necessary. So what's the answer? If cooperation alone doesn't work and coercion alone doesn't work, well, it turns out you know there's downsides to each. If you have cooperation and no coercion, the strong exploit the weak. If you have coercion and no cooperation, you've got the knowledge problem, regulatory capture, and political profit. And all of this says that there's some balance. And that balance is economic freedom. Economic freedom is not less government. Economic freedom is right government. It's government that does not err too far on the side of coercion. But nor is it government that shirks its duties and allows us to move too far into the realm of cooperation. There are a couple of very good data sets on economic freedom. I'll start off by telling you there's no good way to measure this, right? There are competing inadequate ways of measuring it. Um, Heritage Foundation, Fraser Institute. I use the Fraser Institute um, data because it's the most Robust. It's large. They look at lots of countries and states and cities. If you, I, the data I'm going to show you use Fraser 
uh, Fraser Institute's data. If you perform the same analysis I'm going to show you using Heritage, you get the same results. The numbers are different, but directionally everything I'm going to show you is the same. So what they, these organizations do, they try and put a number on each country representing the amount of economic freedom. And they look at a bunch of things, they look at the size of government, legal system, property rights, sound money, trade, freedom, regulation, all sorts of things. I've listed these one, two, three, four, five things. Each one of them has a whole bunch of subcategories. So there's like 50 different things that Fraser will look at when it attempts to measure economic freedom in your country. And remember, it's not saying economic freedom equals less government. It's saying economic freedom equals right government. If you take this data set of economic freedom and cross-reference it with government and UN data that measure socioeconomic outcomes, things that we associate with healthy societies like low poverty, low unemployment, stuff like this. If you cross-reference these two very different data sets, an interesting pattern emerges. Let's start off by looking at poverty. Now, what I'm about to show you is all the countries of the world divided into two groups. The one group is the group that Fraser rates as being below median economic freedom. The other group is the group that Fraser rates as being above median economic freedom. If you look at these two groups, you find the following. There's the group with the below median economic freedom. So these, these countries are erring either on the side of too much coercion or not enough coercion. Now, we all understand governments. When governments err, they tend to err on the side of too much coercion. But when someone says, raises their hand to you and says, yeah, but what about Somalia? Somalia is also erring. They're just going the other direction of not enough, right? But here, here's the poverty rate for these countries. Now, for the countries that are above median economic freedom, there's their poverty rate. Significantly lower. Now, there are exceptions. What you're seeing here are the averages for the two groups. And as you look at this, you might say, yeah, but hang on a second. Being rich does a couple things for you. One is it means less poverty because why? Well, duh, you're rich. Of course you've got less poverty. The other thing is, the richer your country is, the more able your people are to be concerned with esoteric things like freedom. If you're concerned about feeding your children because they might starve, you don't have the time to be thinking about whether I'm economically free or not. You've got bigger worries. So maybe it's the case that what you're seeing with that data is simply the coincidence that countries that are free, excuse me, countries that are rich have low poverty rates because they're rich and they also are more interested in economic freedom because they have the leisure to be interested in economic freedom. That's a reasonable counter-argument. One way to address that counter-argument is to look at the poorest countries on the planet. And so again, I'm going to show you Fraser data. And this time, instead of looking at all the countries on the planet, we're going to look at the poorest 20%. I'm going to take the poorest 20% of countries and divide them into two groups. The poor countries that are more economically free and the poor countries that are less economically free. And if you do that, notice something. Look at the poverty rate here. Astronomical. 80%. These are the poor countries that are less economically free. Here are the poor countries that are more economically free still an astronomical poverty rate, but markedly less. The same pattern emerges. Economic freedom, getting the size of government right, not too much, not too little, yields less poverty. You find the same thing, oddly, with income inequality. If you look at income inequality, and here the height of the bar, this is the Gini coefficient, the height of the bar indicates income inequality. So up is bad, down is good. And if you separate the countries like this, what do you see? Now, people will point to the bar on the right. In fact, they'll never point to the bar on the left. They'll point to the bar on the right and say, see, this is the problem with economic freedom. It yields inequality, income inequality. Yeah, it does. But it yields less income inequality than the alternative, the alternative being a more coercive society. 
gender inequality. This uh, number comes, there's actually, UN has several numbers like this. I'll show you one of them, but they all show you the same thing. Gender inequality, what the UN does here is it looks at the countries of the planet and it asks questions about how similar the two genders are. And they look at a variety of things, income and um, um, political power, how many positions of corporate power are held by women versus men. They'll look at this, they call this gender inequality, right? And they have a number of these things. And what you're seeing here is again, the country separated. The, the ones who don't achieve, who don't come close to that sweet spot of economic freedom and the ones who come closer to that sweet spot of economic freedom. Yes, gender inequality in both cases, but less in the case of the countries that get that balance, get closer to that right balance of cooperation and coercion. And I'm not going to bore you with more numbers, but if you're interested, I have an um, article with uh, James Harrigan um, and Monique T uh, Teague that look at all these things. We look at income, unemployment, we look at peace, how peaceful are countries, environmental outcomes, air pollution, deforestation, we look at gender empowerment measures, we look across countries, we look across states, we look across cities, and every time you look, you see the same pattern. Societies that come closer to that right balance of cooperation and coercion score better on these socioeconomic outcomes. So this right balance is what? The right balance is enough government to prevent people from imposing harm on each other, but otherwise leaving them alone. And if you think back to the example of driving I gave you, and I gave you this example of driving as, as an example of coercion gone bad. This is a stupid way to drive, to paint people's windows black and put cameras on the thing and let some central planners tell you where to drive. Clearly, we should not be driving by coercion. Yeah, except notice something. We don't drive entirely by cooperation either. Think about your driving experience. You are free to decide. Do I speed up? Do I slow down? Do I turn left? Do I turn right? These are all things that you should decide on a cooperative basis with the drivers around you. What don't you get to decide? When the light's red, you stop. When it's green, you can go. You drive on the right side of the road. You have a speed limit sign that at least you have to come close to, right? We do use coercion in driving, but notice how we use it. In driving, the coercion is aimed almost exclusively at preventing you from imposing harm on the other drivers. That's the right balance of cooperation and coercion. Prevent you from harming others, but otherwise leave you alone to make decisions for yourself. And this is not a new idea. Thomas Jefferson said, a wise and frugal government which shall restrain men from injuring one another, which shall leave them otherwise free to regulate their own pursuits. This is the sum of good government. Jefferson said, economic freedom the right balance of cooperation and coercion, that's the formula for a prosperous society. If you have enjoyed this, I highly recommend you my weekly podcast, Words and Numbers, where I and my co-host, James Harrigan, who's a political scientist, talk about, we come out each week, and we talk about stuff that's going on in the world aimed at, at people who are non-experts but interested in what's going on. So I, an economist, he, a political scientist, and we've got like 250 episodes in the tank. We still come out every week. Check us out. We're on all major podcast players. Thank you, Dr. Davies. All right. Thank you for your uh, talk. That was very interesting. And uh, I just uh, wanted to clarify a point or ask you about uh, diversity as a point of why coercion might not, might not be able or, or why... Uh, Cooperation might not be able to work to its like fullest. Um, I, I think of like the law, like the law of comparative advantage, like like uh, Ricardo and all that. When you say that, and I, I think that diversity itself is uh, like something that pushes cooperation. It, it seems like for the most part, and where people, where, where you, in societies where the rich take advantage of the poor, it seems like there's a already a state existing, and they use that as a mechanism to do so. So I I, I fail to kind of like make the connection and see why total cooperation might not be preferable to um, the middle ground. Are, okay, so let me, let me try and paraphrase. Are you asking why is diversity bad? 
Yeah. Or, yeah. or, or, or wait, um, I'm, maybe you're not you're not claiming that diversity is bad. I'm just s- asking why it's some why it's a reason why cooperation doesn't work. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So diversity is a double-edged sword, right? Because on the one hand, it is the source of, of so much um, of the vibrance that comes from cooperation. The mere fact that you can do things that I can't means that we can come together and we can both benefit. So clearly that's a great thing. My point here is that that's not the only possible effect of diversity. Another possible effect is you could be born into a situation that is so far superior to mine that you could, in the absence of restraint, um, exploit me. And, and therein lies an argument for, a, for government as a coercive force that is a neutral arbiter to say, no, look, there are certain rules of the game, and you're breaking the rules when you impose on this guy. Can I ask a little follow-up? Um, it, it just seems to me that if that, I think that is kind of, I think it is true to, some, to a great extent, but when it comes to, like, if, if, I, if someone has an absolute advantage over me in, a, like, a lot of affairs and a lot of things, um, it seems to me that if we did have, if we needed a state to mediate that, it just seems to me like, why would I be the one actually making the state, controlling it, and actually improving my own condition? Why, would, why wouldn't the person who has absolute advantage over me be the one creating the state? Yeah, yeah. In other words, why couldn't we just handle this privately? Yeah. Um, we can, and we often do. We have examples. Um, my students will say to me, well, you need government for a police force. And I point to the Duquesne police that are non-governmental. They're a private police force. And in fact, I point to them, I say, when was the last time you had an interaction with the Duquesne police officer versus a Pittsburgh police officer? And notice the difference in reaction, right? It's actually much better. So, so yes, it can be handled privately. Here's the thing that bothers me as an economist. If you look back through history, every time humans have come together, they have evolved some form of government that tells me that government itself is the result of spontaneous order. And if that's the case, I have to take it seriously. Yeah, yeah, all right, thank you. Sure. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Davies. So our table had a bit of a different direction. Um, Going back to your very first analogy with um, coercion, um, you had the, the hand representing coercion, specifically government, and we wanted to know, do you think that um, coercion could be produced by a non-government entity, specifically a private corporation. So, for using your example, you have, instead of government, you have Facebook. Instead of dresses or suits, you have political opinions. So, you know, Facebook comes in and says, even though you have this opinion and that person's interested in it, we're going to deplatform you and give you this opinion instead. So, do you think that that works? I mean, I understand all analogies break down at some point, but the very, con- like, I, like, speaking to your book, do you include discussions on how private corporations or private entities, non-government entities, could use coercion? Or, or on, con- on contrast, could the government you know, I- encourage cooperation? Right, yeah. And, and yes to both answers, uh, to both questions. Um, when, when I use the example of you beating on me, that's you using coercion. It's an, it's an un how should I say, unauthorized. It's an unsanctioned use of coercion. It's not something we all got together and agreed this is a valid use of coercion. In fact, most of us would say it's a bad use of coercion. Right? Um, just as a side note, Facebook deplatforming people is not coercion. It's Facebook's platform. It's their property. So they're free to do with what they like. I don't like what they're doing, mm-hmm. but they're not coercing me. I'm there freely. If I don't mm-hmm. like it that much, I can walk away. Mm-hmm. All right, well, thank you. Um, so in deciding what degree and what things the government should coerce, to what degree should a moral framework inform the level of coercion a government enacts? Um, and are there some cases when a government has an obligation to coerce certain behaviors, even if it will lead to less economic gain? Because I know, for example, there were some economists who found that abortion actually reduced crime levels but that doesn't mean that we should permit abortion, for example? Yeah, and so the problem here is, and I want to underline, there are some questions that we simply can't answer. But I want to underline here, um, 
it's important that you start from a first principle. What is your first principle? If the first principle is you own yourself, then that should inform what sorts of rules the government imposes. Now, the interesting thing here is that particular first principle in the question of abortion can actually cut both ways. Because on the one hand, I could say, well, I'm a woman. I own myself. And you have no right to be telling me what I may or may not do with my body. On the other hand, you can say the unborn child is a person, and it owns itself. And you cannot wantonly destroy it. And notice what happens here. I don't have an answer to the question, but I, but I do think I know where the question needs to be asked. The question on which this abortion issue hinges is at what point does a human being become a rights-bearing entity? We've never addressed that question. We understand that at birth we have a rights-bearing entity. And we understand that in the nanosecond before conception we don't have a rights-bearing entity. But we haven't explored where in that nine-month interval we go from not rights-bearing to rights-bearing. If you can identify that, you can answer this question at a first principles level. You can say that the first principle of I own myself is applying to the woman, or you can say it applies to the child, and therefore, while we're not denying it to the woman, we do have a conflict of rights, and it's very clear which of those two rights must take precedence. So I think, I think the answer to your question here is, in my opinion, we've been asking the wrong question all along. I don't have an answer to the question, but I think we've been asking the wrong question. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Hi. Ethan. I'm from Patrick Henry College. Bear with me as I try to explain my question. <laughs> so you have this balance in between cooperation and coercion. There's some sort of mean, and there's a point at which you start using coercion. In your example with driving, you, you suppose that it was appropriate maybe to use coercion whenever there's a risk to a third party, and that actually has to do with abortion. So in abortion, for example, if you said life began right away, then termination of that life, there's a 100% chance that that act is going to harm a third party, right? So we would maybe theoretically say that coercion is appropriate. So my question is, at what point in the prognosis, what level of probability Right. of risk to a third party, does it now become appropriate? Because it seems like, well, I mean, that would be the argument for compelling vaccines, right? Is sure. You pose a third party harm or a potential harm to a third party, and so we'll coerce you to do this. So yeah. what are some more case-by-case -case bases? So um, let, let me, if you don't mind, let me pick a more neutral topic. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's think about DUI laws. Now, DUI laws are interesting because we have made it illegal to drive while intoxicated even if you haven't harmed anybody. Right. And that seems to, to violate this idea of the right balance of cooperation and coercion. Nobody's been harmed. Except here's the thing. There are some harms that are so great they aren't recoverable. That is, if I'm burning trash in my backyard and there's a chance that sparks can come over and burn your house down. That's a recoverable harm, that I can pay you whatever the value of your house is, or my insurance will pay you whatever the value of your house is. That's recoverable. If I'm driving while intoxicated and I kill your family, that's not recoverable. There's no amount of money I can give you that will make you whole. So in that instance where you're talking about an action that can result in an irrevocable harm, that I think it becomes appropriate to consider a priori coercion. That is, we're going to stop you before the harm happens because we can't deal with it. We can't make the guy whole after the fact. Now, that leaves, I understand, lots of unanswered questions. You can come up with examples of, well, okay, here's a harm that's irrevocable, but the probability is so low. Yeah, 
I don't know. I'm not offering this as a, as a one-stop solution to all the problems, but rather as a, as a framework for thinking about them. And it will help you think about a lot of them. There will be other ones on the edges that you can't think of, and there will be some that we never can resolve. All right. Thank you. Sure. Hi. Great speech, by the way. Um, my question would be, would you say that government or regulatory government or deregulatory government come closer to the equilibrium of coercion and cooperation? Yeah, so here's, here's an interesting thing to keep in your pocket. When people ask me questions about regula regulated markets versus unregulated markets, I stop them and say, hang on, there is no such thing as an unregulated market. Every market is regulated. The question is whether it's government regulated or consumer regulated. And it turns out businesses are far more afraid of consumer regulation than they are of government regulation. I'll give you, just to go off the topic for a moment, I'll give you a beautiful example of this. Um, some of you might remember this was about, I don't know, five years ago, maybe seven years ago. Rush Limbaugh called the woman, Sandra Fluke, some horrible thing on his, on his radio show. And it took all of about 48 hours for Rush Limbaugh to get on the air and, and apologize for what he said. Why did he apologize? It wasn't because some government regulator came along and said, you know, we're going to regulate you. It wasn't even because Sandra Fluke filed a lawsuit against him, which I don't think she did. But it's none of that. The reason he got on the air within 48 hours and apologized was because his advertisers threatened to pull their advertising from his show because they, in turn, were petrified that the consumers would associate their product with him and stop buying their product. That's how petrified they were of consumer regulation, that you can go you know, three steps away from Rush, and that's the force that's causing him to do what he does. So, so when it comes to regulation, I, I would say the, you know, there is no such thing as the unregulated market. So the question then comes to your question, what's, what's the more efficacious form of regulation? Is it government regulation or is it consumer regulation? And I would fall back on this touchstone I gave you, which is the question, are we imposing harm on somebody else? If you're not imposing harm on somebody else, I think consumer regulation is absolutely the thing you need. If you are imposing harm on somebody else, I think government regulation is the thing that you need. And so, for example, I, as much of a staunch free marketer as I am, in fact, in this room, I'll tell you, in my heart of hearts, I'm an anarchist. I just have to take government seriously because of the spontaneous order argument I just gave you. But, but I would say, look, if you're dealing with something like pollution, where you've got a company that can impose harm on, some, on, on another, absolutely, um, government regulation is appropriate there. If you're talking about something like fair trade, where you're not imposing a harm in the sense that, that economists mean harm, consumer regulation is the right way to go. And the benefit of consumer regulation is it's much more flexible and it reflects the actual, it reflects people's beliefs, their intentions, which are a lot different than what they exp express in the voting booth. You say, well, the voting booth expresses their intentions. No, it doesn't. What expresses your intentions is your willingness to put money on the table and say, yeah, I'll take that product or no, I'm not going to take that product, I'll take another one. You put money on the table, that really expresses your, your, your sentiments. And that's where consumer regulation comes in. Government regulation is me just flipping a switch and saying, yeah, I'll vote for this guy versus that guy. I have no skin in the game when I'm doing that. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. okay. I also, I had one other just quick question. Uh, to clarify on the income tax examples you were saying earlier, I know a lot in the media, they like to portray these huge... Um, magnates like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos is never paying or paying 0% income tax. So I just wanted to see if there's any truth to that, given what you said prior. Could you repeat just louder? Uh, yeah. So in regards to the media claims that Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos pay 0% income tax, right. um, going back to what you were saying with the income tax during your speech, I just wanted to see if there's any tr actual truth to that or what your thoughts were. Yeah. So there's a bait and switch going on here. Um, Some of, at least some of the argument that the rich aren't paying taxes is coming from a calculation that nobody does except the couple of politicians who raise this. And that's dividing um, tax by wealth. We don't tax wealth in this country. 
So if you do that division, of course you're going to come up with a ridiculously small number. Um, in the case of Amazon, it's a little bit different. Um, Am and I'm not talking about Bezos, I'm talking about the company Amazon. Um, Amazon, the argument Bernie Sanders gave for, for a while, up until recently, was that Amazon paid no taxes, which is actually incorrect. Amazon paid, in the year he was talking about, which I think was 2018, Amazon paid over a billion dollars in taxes. Now, it paid no corporate income tax, but it paid plenty of payroll taxes and excise taxes and import tariffs and this sort of thing. Um, but you might ask the question, well, why didn't it pay corporate income taxes? Because it had income. It didn't because of the rules that Bernie Sanders and his colleagues put into place. They put rules into place that said, if you incur losses over a number of years, you can accumulate those losses to offset future profits. So for example, I take a $10 loss here, and I take a $15 gain the next year. Under the rules, I'm not taxed on the $15 gain. I'm taxed on the difference, the $5 difference between what I made this year and what I lost last year. And that seems fair if you think about it. And in fact, Congress tweaked that law to encourage companies like Amazon to invest in infrastructure, to create new jobs. And this is what congressmen said. They said, look, this is why we're doing this. And what did Amazon do? It had this, this contest amongst the US cities to open up two um, new offices, each one employing 50,000 people. That's ex Amazon was doing exactly what the Congress asked it to do in formulating that particular tax incentive. And now, Congress wants, I say Congress, it's a a few people in Congress want the benefit of both things. They want to say, yeah, Amazon created these jobs. Oh, yeah, and look, Amazon's not paying taxes. Well, yeah, it's not paying taxes because you, that's the rules that you put in place. Is that okay? Yeah, okay. thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so you defined diversity as um, the rich, pretty brilliant, talented differences between us. Yet the left defines it as something very superficial, whether it's your, whether it's being a man, a woman, your skin color, or any ethnicities. So my question is, and especially since the left is seeking to eliminate those forms of diversity of being rich, poor, pretty, those types of things, how do we cooperate when diversity is being used as a form of coercion instead of a measure for cooperation? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. And I wanna say here, I'm not, I'm not denying by any means diversity of, skin color, ethnicity, or anything like that, or, or gender, um, that's all diversity also. What I'm saying is that diversity is much broader than that. To reduce any one of you to your gender, race, ethnicity is to dehumanize you in a pretty serious manner. Because, yeah, you may be diverse in those ways, but you're diverse in lots of other ways as well. And it's, it's that sum total of diversity that becomes important. Now, in certain ways, certain aspects of your diversity enable you to maybe be in a position to exploit me, other aspects less so. As an economist, it's those aspects that enable you to exploit me that concern me most, at least in the context of this discussion, and that's why I underline it. All right, thank you. Thank you so much for coming and speaking with us today. Um, our table was very encouraged and interested in the term of right government or proper amounts of government in a world where we talk about more or less and then you use the word right. How does that concept operate with the dual federalist system? So federal government, if it's the right size, how do then state governments operate themselves as right or the proper size? Yeah, and there's an interesting thing here. The term that our brothers and sisters on the right will use is federalism. The term that our brothers and sisters on the left will use is subsidiarity. I encourage you to use that word as much as you can if your goal is to build bridges. Because subsidiarity means governing at the lowest possible level. If you've got a problem that the local government can handle, don't ele elevate it to the state. Only elevate to the state the things the local government can't handle. And similarly, only elevate to the federal level things the state can't handle. That's what the founders called federalism. It's what today people call subsidiarity. And if you do that, you create, you bring to the political sphere the same competitive forces that make the economic sphere so vibrant. Why is it that um, Uber satisfies my needs so well? Because it has to compete with taxis, with buses, with Lyft, with 
my neighbor who's going to give me a lift somewhere, this sort of thing. It's got to compete. And, and because of this competition, it's constantly looking for how can it do its job better. Because the better it does its job, the more likely I am to choose it next time. If we govern according to the principle of subsidiarity, all of a sudden cities are doing that and states are doing that. In fact, notice something. Particularly in the age of COVID, when we've all learned how to work remotely, notice what national governments are doing. They're calling for a global minimum corporate income tax. What are they trying to do? They're trying to prevent that competitive force. They're trying to prevent businesses in the United States from moving to Mexico mm -hmm. because it's a better tax environment. They're doing at, at a federal governmental level what the federal government itself has said is illegal. We have a name for that. It's antitrust, right? They're forming an oligopoly where all the companies get together and they price, the countries get together and they price fix, right? So, so to go back to your question, if we can govern at the lowest possible level like that, we encourage innovation. Some cities and states will get it right, other ones will get it wrong. But the beauty is the ones that get it wrong will learn from the ones that get it right. Right now, California is learning. A painful lesson, but it's learning. That's what you get with subsidiarity. And what we tend to do, we tend to do the opposite. We tend to go immediately. You see a problem, you run to Washington. You start crying about how to go and fix this problem. And I've got the solution, and it goes coast to coast. And notice something interesting here. And I'm neither, I'm neither praising nor detracting from our previous president. But I think Trump, either deliberately or accidentally, I don't know which, but I think he got it right, his response to COVID. His response to COVID was to sit back and do pretty much nothing, which you could point to and say, what's he doing? This is a national calamity. He's not doing anything. What he's doing is allowing subsidiarity to play out. And so you get a solution in New York mm -hmm. that wouldn't work in Wisconsin, and a solution in Wisconsin that wouldn't work in California. Mm -hmm. The different states trying different things. That was the right approach. Mm -hmm. The more we can do that, I think the better off we are. Thank you. Sure. Just a quick uh, question. You were talking about the um, the ranking of different countries by their levels of economic freedom, right? Uh, where does the United States fall? Is it is it too much or too little, or um, yeah, just where does it fall in that? Ranking? Yeah. So so here's the thing. As much as what I've said, and I'm repeating what Jefferson has said. Um, Neither Jefferson nor I knew the, know the answer of what the right level of government is. I mean, I've said words that, that describe what the right answer looks like. Government that prevents people from harming each other, but otherwise leaves them alone, which is the same thing Jefferson said, right? Um, but exactly what that looks like, I'm not quite sure. I can tell you some things that don't look like it, right? So there is no, I can't tell you that there's this, this number in the sand, 7.25. And that's the right number. What I can tell you is that in terms of economic freedom, and understand governments tend to err on the side of too much government. So generally, when you hear economic freedom, it tends to mean less. Not always, but it tends to mean less. Um, the United States was up until uh, 2001. We were consistently like number three, three to five. We're in the top five for economic freedom, countries across the world. Since 9-11, we have dropped, I think currently we're, according to Fraser's numbers, we're like around 10 to 12, maybe top 15, somewhere in there. So we've lost a tremendous amount of freedom. And these numbers are lagged, so I'm not going to know what, we, what the age of COVID looks like for another few years. But my guess is that when we look back to 2020, we're going to see that we're dropped to maybe in, to the top 20 or something. So, so I, I, I can't say, where, I can't say where, where we are relative to the right spot, but I can say that it's somewhere, somewhere toward less government than what we have now. Okay, thank you. I just have a question. I wanted to hear your comments, thinking about consumer sovereignty and how important that is. Um, thinking about the, the cooperation coercion framework you're talking about, could you talk a little bit about, um, say, divestiture campaigns, woke capitalism, stakeholder capitalism, you know, the idea of using corporate monies to benefit various, quote-unquote, stakeholders? Is that 
cooperative? Is that coercive? Uh, especially where there's maybe differences between management and shareholders or the general public. So anyways, all those really broad categories, but I'm curious if you have thoughts about how those sorts of things fit into the cooperation framework. Yeah, and the question here is, can you walk away? So the board of directors of, suppose I'm a stockholder of Walmart, and the Walmart board of directors votes to spend 20% of the company's profits um, promoting fair trade coffee. That's not coercion. It's not coercion because I'm voluntarily a stockholder. It's my money they're using, but that's part of the deal of my being a stockholder. If I don't like it, I can walk away, and divest myself, and invest in some other company. So it's not coercion. Um, the government saying, Walmart, you must spend 20% of your profits promoting fair trade coffee. Yeah, that's a problem. That's clearly coercion. I can't walk away from that. Well, I mean, I can walk away in the sense of I can give up my ownership of Walmart, except what's happened is this was never part of the agreement. When I bought into Walmart, the agreement was that we're going to have a board of directors that's going to decide what to do with the company's profits, and I, I agree to that. I never agreed to the government coming in and saying, okay, now Walmart, you can do whatever you want, to which people will say, well, yes, you did agree to that by being a member of society. That's hand-waving when you agree to that. I tell you what we did agree to. We agreed to a constitution. And in that constitution, Article 1, Section 8 lists about eight or nine things the federal government is permitted to do. And dictating to Walmart how it spends its profit is not one of those eight or nine things. So if you want to talk in terms of what we agreed to, that's not one of the things. Thank you.